Discussion at the end for the city questions, special direction a little bit. Yeah, after we can also Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll see how how because I think yeah we're gonna probably start in five minutes. Ah yeah, we are already a little bit. Yeah, just Excuse me. And this microphone. Uh, it should be involved, but, uh, yeah. Discuss it. I'm sure we can arrange it. Yeah, I think it's fine. Maybe we even made no witness. Maybe we just saw some problem. It's all about. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? Shall I stand if you want to stay? Uh, as you wish. Oh, as you wish. Uh, okay, I can do the top. You do the second. Yeah. Okay, we're going to start. So welcome everyone to the first Volcano session. So there is three Volcano sessions uh, with INSA application. So we're going to start today uh, with Susie Edmeyer that's going to present uh, interaction of volcanoes in uh, Galapagos. So we, because we have a bit of time, because one uh, speaker cancelled the last one, so we have going to have like the talk about 20 minutes and then we have some time for the question so the speaker can take 20 minutes and then i can give you a two minutes warning okay. yeah no no after him after him we have from 12 30 to 12 50 uh, before the lunch we have some time so we can discuss uh, about like open question and seed question but we can also have more time for the speaker to to give their presentation. Okay, Susie, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, I can say it feels really nice to give a fringe presentation in here instead of an undergraduate lecture. Um, it's definitely a much nicer use of the room. And I don't have to monitor everyone's phone use, make sure people are paying attention and do the follow-up exercise. So this is, this is lovely. Um, there are also more of you than we have undergraduate geophysicists. So that's, that's good too. <laughs> Right, so I'm presenting some work from one of my PhD students from Owen Redden on the um, deformation of the Western Galapagos. The other thing that's particularly nice about being, being able to present this at an ESA meeting is that uh, this is work that was actually quite directly funded by ESA, 
So it went into a, a proposal that I made for a Living Planet Fellowship all the way back in 2014. I had to go and look it up um, to try and apply independent component analysis to Galapagos deformation. And then for various reasons, because the time series were quite short and because I got distracted by, by other things, um, it never really happened then. Um, and Owen has incorporated it into his PhD thesis as a kind of central chapter. So Owen is at the rugby in France at the moment, so he's not here to present it himself. Um, so I'm going to try and do his, his work justice today. So the Galapagos is a really beautiful place to, to work on INSAR. Um, you have very high magnitude signals. You have um, exceptionally high rates of eruption, rates of intrusion, and the beautiful geodetic expression across all the islands. And they're all so amazingly coherent. There are six volcanoes in the Western Galapagos, of which five have had multiple um, 20th century eruptions. Um, and the fact that the, the crust in the Galapagos is relatively thin means that you have multiple points of magma ascent within relatively close proximity, so within 100 kilometers of each other. Um, so the figures here just show the um, 20th century eruption at the Western Galapagos volcanoes and um, a selection of the more recent um, effusive events on the right there. So the Galapagos has been incredibly well studied by, by this community, by people uh, using INSAR, including several people in the room. Um, so if your, if your paper is not on this slide, then, then apologies. <laughs> but um, a lot of this work has focused on either uh, studies that essentially look at long-term displacements um, over, over decades, um, or they have focused really on eruptive events. And that's understandable because the eruptions in the Galapagos are spectacular. There are also these amazingly large intrusions especially associated with the larger calderas like at Sierra Negra. Um, but the take that we've, the approach that we've taken has been to try and look at um, complete time series of deformation in the Galapagos with a focus on the inter-eruptive periods rather than the um, eruptive events and major intrusions alone. So this is a, a summary of what we've discerned at a kind of like first past level geodetically from looking at Galapagos volcanoes. Uh, so that incorporates uh, historical observations made by other people, mostly from elastic half-space modeling um, and Owen's modeling of sources um, in the Sentinel era. And all of the volcanoes um, in this group have geodetic evidence of relatively shallow reservoirs, so from two to three kilometers depth. Um, and several also have evidence of larger storage zones at around five kilometers. Um, and we're somewhat limited at looking at deeper depths in the Galapagos because of the size of the, of, of the islands themselves. So from adding in the Sentinel data and looking at the, the more recent time series, um, that you can do a couple of things that hasn't been possible before in the Galapagos just because of the, um, the temporal resolution of, of the data sets. Um, but the first kind of the first kind of baseline observation that Owen's been able to make from this work has been that actually the magmatic sources in the Galapagos are pretty consistent. People do tend to find similar storage zones to within error. Um, using a variety of different modeling approaches. And you have kind of clusters um, clusters in the um, location and the, the, the volumes of, of the magma storage areas that have been found using INSAR. Um, the cartoon on the right of this slide summarizes what other people have, um, the way that other people have described magmatic systems in the Galapagos. Um, and Owen's findings from the Sentinel data um, really fit into that relatively well. There don't seem to be any major changes uh, in the most recent uh, time period. So our focus has really been on trying to ask the question of what do the relationship between the deformation patterns at the volcanoes actually tell us about Galapagos volcanism? So can we use it as um, a window on deeper processes? Um, and the approach that we've taken to that is looking at the time series and trying to look for similarities between them. So this is the main uh, figure with fringes. In the fringe presentation. Um, this is actually the descending displacements for the Galapagos since 2017. Um, and you can see the time series on the left um, have a lot of structures associated with the eruptions. Fernandina eruptions are marked there in red. Um, there was a major eruption of Sierra Negra, um, which is uh, marked on a blue hash blocks, and then a couple of intrusive episodes as well. Um, to get everybody's eye in, I would like to draw your attention to a couple of major events. Um, so Fernandina and Sierra Negra erupted in relatively quick succession in 2018. Um, that's in that pink box there. And you can see already just by looking at the time series, there are some common features in the displacements um, that span this period. So even though the eruptions were at the Fernandina and Sierra Negra volcanoes, you can see a, a change in the 
displacement direction at Darwin, and something similar at uh, Cerro Azul. And you can see something, I think, even more spectacular before the wolf eruption of 2020, where you have a change in the direction of displacement at Darwin, where there was no eruptive activity and no evidence of any unrest, um, and also at Alcedo, which are volcanoes which are really quite a long distance away from, from the eruption that took place at Wolf. Um, so that's the kind of first order observation. Um, it isn't a new one. Other people have pointed this out before. So uh, this is from Scott Baker's thesis in 2012. So he identified four periods of um, commonality in deformation trends uh, and also in other expressions of unrest, so sort of seismicity, um, during the period from 2020 to 2006 to 2009, so the ERS and NVSAT era. Um, and we started off with the approach of trying to um, see which pairs of volcanoes seem to have correlations in their deformation, the idea being it might be a kind of pairwise correlation, because that seemed to be what Scott's uh, observations showed. Um, so he saw uh, similarities between the Fernandina and Alcedo deformation. Um, so this grid uh, shows all of the volcanoes. It shows particular episodes that have been identified as having kind of some apparent uh, correlation in, in unrest. Um, with a symbol uh, representing when, when those have taken place. And you can see from Scott's earlier work, the pink circles, um, that really seem to be a kind of a pairwise phenomenon. And we tried to take a similar approach and essentially we ended up having a symbol in every single box, because when you started looking into it, you could kind of identify um, matching details of the time series uh, between all of the different pairs of volcanoes. So that really allowed us to make a more robust investigation of whether this correlation is uh, is real and reliable, and we can actually use it to understand something about the geophysics of the system. Um, so the first approach we used to do this was straightforward identification of turning points, looking for places where your, uh, second, your um, gradient was zero, so you switch from um, uplift to subsidence or vice versa, or you had a major rate change um, on, on filtered time series. And hopefully uh, the, kind of the red and gray bars on this image match where your eye would naturally pick out the turning points in the time series. Um, just to, to get your eye in, those pink boxes are the same as the ones I showed before. So the first one refers to the Fernandina and Sierra Negra uh, events in 2018. And the second one is the, the, the run up to the Wolf 2022 eruption. Um, the next approach was using windowed paired correlation analysis. So that's all of the, uh, every line on the Y axis here is a different pair of volcanoes. That's for both the ascending and the descending data sets. The blue and the red boxes here show where you have uh, correlation values that exceed 0.9, uh, with red being a positive correlation and blue being a negative correlation. And you can see you have these quite kind of satisfying clusters through time um, in these boxes that show uh, you have episodes of enhanced correlation between different pairs of volcanoes that seem to occur uh, at the same time. And then this last method, um, is temporal independent component analysis. So essentially that's an approach which allows you to um, break um, random variable down into different components which where the their um, independence is maximized. So in this case, we've applied that temporally. So we've tried to maximize the independence of the temporal components. Um, the figure here shows Owen's approach to downsampling the Galapagos. So he had about 8,000 time series. Um, he took those at a, a a spatial resolution which is a little bit higher around the calderas and otherwise just an even grid across the rest of the islands. Um, and then he did a temporal ICA um, on those 8,000 time series um, for the different time periods and time periods with moving windows across the um, across the whole Sentinel data set. Um, then um, we used the clustering approach to looking at the retrieved components to test their significance. Um, but what was really useful about this is that you get uh, temporally independent components, which essentially look like time series. Um, and then you get a mixing matrix, which gives you the relative strength of those time series in all the different locations around the graphic. So what the results I'm going to show you really use those maps. So for this first period that I pointed out before, the 2018 events involving uh, Fernandina and, and Sierra Negra, um, you can see we have a, a temporal component, which has a turning point uh, during the Sierra Negra eruption. And that has a high weighting over Sierra Negra itself, but also over all of the other volcanoes. It's non-zero at every single um, other volcano in the Western Galapagos, although it's particularly strong here in Fernandina. And I think even more impressively, um, you have a temporal component which seems to uh, match precisely the, the timing of, of the wolf eruption, which is weighted strongly 
at uh, Fernandina and Sierra Negra, um, and to some extent at Sierra Azul as well. So I think this is a really kind of nice test of, um, of the robustness of these correlations. So the most the kind of the obvious question to this is, well, couldn't this just be a processing artifact? Couldn't this just be because you've used a common reference pixel, or could it be a kind of common atmospheric feature or kind of something to do with a, a hydrothermal uh, system? And you know, that's something we worried about and thought about quite a bit. So we kind of tested the possibility of it being a um, being to do with your choice of reference pixel. You can see those are actually plotted in the time series in panel A there. Um, and also played with atmospheric corrections and see that there was any way that we could try and um, get similar results uh, from something to do with the processing. And we're pretty confident that's not the case. Um, the next possibility is that it's something to do with static stress interactions. These are very active systems. Couldn't it just be that an eruption at Sierra Negra was affecting the neighboring systems at Sierra Azul? Um, and we also don't think that's convincing. It's certainly not enough to explain the degree of correlation between the time series. Um, for example, this very large event at Sierra Negra in 2018, um, it didn't, it, the dilational strain that it produced didn't really extend very much further than the neighboring volcanoes. It certainly wouldn't have affected wool. So that seems a, a, a kind of unlikely scenario. Um, we also thought a little bit about whether there was a, um, some sort of volume changes that could be happening somewhere we don't see them. So for example, you can see beneath um, the channel between Fernandina and Isabella, um, but we don't really see any evidence for that in the data, and there aren't any kind of culprit events that seem like it could have caused this sort of static stress change. So that leaves us with shallow hydraulic connections, which I think if they existed in the Galapagos, we would see them geodetically um, because the coherence is really good. And where there is lateral movement in, in the Galapagos, it produces amazing deformation. So we think that one's also not plausible, which leaves us the possibility of deeper connections between leg and supplies. Uh, which is what we think that is the, the right answer here. Um, so to summarize what this looks like, we have correlations in displacement between all of the pairs of the six different volcanoes. Um, these are during eruptive episodes that last days to weeks, but they're also kind of more interestingly in interruptive periods over the last weeks to years. Um, we have trends between episodes of general uplift and subsidence, turning points in the same place. Um, one thing that people have sometimes asked about this is, well, if you have well, a couple of monotonic processes, obviously they'll be correlated because if they're both uplifting, they'll look like they're correlated, uh, which is true. But what we also see here is uh, correlations in the small time series variations that are pulled out by the temporal ICA and the correlation analysis. So it's more than just that. Um, so one of the things that uh, Owen worked on recently was estimating the probability of two volcanoes having uh, a major change in their deformation event in their deformation rate at random um, at a particular time, which is based on the idea, it's based on the, um, the number of major changes you have over a particular period, and then just assuming that they're randomly distributed, which you know, they're, they're not actually. Uh, but if they were, we would expect that probability to be less than a percent. Uh, and similarly, the probability of Sierra Negra and Fernandina erupting within a six month window based on their 20th century eruption rate seems to be less than a percentage as well. So. Uh, we're pretty convinced that these correlations are real and they mean something. Oh, sorry, it's having it's a bit fuzzy. Um, so then we started to look at what we could link these correlations to, what, what other factors uh, we could discern from the geodetic data that might be linked to it. And the obvious, obvious place to start is looking at the intrusive flux. Um, so the, the left-hand side of this panel here is from, from Marco's work, uh, where he looked at the um, cumulative volume change um, in, that was intruded into the Western Galapagos Islands, and Owen has updated this with the Sentinel data. Um, and we can see that there's a temporal variation in the total intrusive flux, but also a variation in the share of magma supplied to the different, different volcanoes in the Galapagos through time, um, which is kind of consistent with uh, historical observations of clustering um, in the eruptions that take place there, and this uh, idea of um, magmatic flushing, which comes from the petrology in the Galapagos. So if we compare the correlation count, so that's the, the number of highly correlated pairs of time series uh, to the intrusive flux, we find that we have particularly high correlation counts during episodes of very high, um, very, very high rate intrusion. So that uh, I think it's easiest to see again in 2018 around the Sierra Negra eruption, um, but also uh, right at the end of our time series there, you can see there's kind of an uptick at the end associated with the wolf eruption, both in the positive correlation count and the negative correlation count. So that leaves us with um, 
Sorry, this actually looks okay on the speaker ready computer, but there we go. <laughs> um, so the majority of the strong correlations between pairs of displacements were episodes of uplift um, at multiple systems and they're correlated with high supply. And that's something that's kind of uh, conceptually straightforward, right? It kind of makes sense. You have more magma coming into the base of these systems and more magma entering the shallow system, you have a correlated uplift. Um, you'd have something similar with a positive correlation from subsidence during an episode of lowered supply into the transcostal magmatic zones. Um, essentially just because you're entering a period of, um, of, of, of cooling and, and less magma going into the shallow system. In some ways more interesting, you have negatively correlated displacements, which we had at a few points during the, 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 um, the time series we've looked at. Um, and they were obviously associated with major eruptions. Um, you, anything, can, anything that perturbs the system in a top-down sort of way instead of a bottom-up way uh, could have that impact. Um, but also we think in variations of in the supply of magma um, from the from the melt zone into the shallow crust. So that could be because, for example, of enhanced melt production underneath one volcano, or it could be because of a, a pathway opening. And we can't see that uh, from the data directly. So the question then is how deep are the connections between these volcanoes? Um, so there's two bits of a couple of bits of evidence here. So um, over the last 10,000 years, the lava compositions at the Galapagos volcanoes are, are distinctive. So it looks like they're sampling geochemically different parts of the Galapagos plume. So that puts kind of a floor on the potential depths of our uh, source of interaction. They're obviously above that. Um, and we don't see any geodetic evidence of lateral transfer. So that's a kind of upper limit. They have to be below that. Um, and then that's quite a big zone in between those two limits. But by analogy, um, at Hawaii, there's been recent evidence for, of an asthenospheric melt layer um, from seismic imaging, um, and it's also been hypothesized from other people from earlier work. And something similar has also been proposed to lie under El Hierro in the Canary Islands. So that seems like it might also be a plausible scenario for the Galapagos Islands too. So that leaves us with a kind of overall picture of um, the Galapagos volcanism that looks something like this, uh, you know, with some question marks and with some kind of um, uncertainty on, on some, of the, some of the structures. Um, but we know we've got distinct vertically extensive subvolcanic magmatic zones underneath the volcanoes. We know there is some zone where they can interact with each other, which we think is uh, below crustal depths, um, because that's been seen in other places. Um, and we know that each volcano taps an isotopically distinct source of melt from, from deeper. Um, so that gives that's our conceptual model that comes from looking at interactions in the time series. Um, so I'll stop there. I think I've got over by a couple of minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we see consistent correlations in displacements in the Western Galapagos, and these are especially strong during episodes of heightened magmatic flux into the shallow crust. Um, there are correlations in this displacement, but um, with distinct isotopic signatures, which suggests um, you have connections at depth, but not at the source of the melt. Um, and I think this is a, a a kind of nice illustration of what you can do by looking at time series over a much bigger area at neighboring volcanoes, at clustering volcanoes, rather than treating them as isolated events. So I think we can learn a lot more um, by taking this approach than by looking at systems in isolation. I think that's me. Thanks for having me. So we have time for a couple of questions. We have a micro. I can hear if you shout. Uh, <laughs> So, so my, my question is, uh, so I noticed that for like the 2018 Sierra Negra eruption, it looks like there's, there's six to eight meters of subsidence that happened and you're showing something like an order of a meter. So does that, uh, I guess, I don't know enough about the ICA analysis to know whether, does that affect any of the, uh, 
connections with some of the other time series. In other words, if there's a big a disproportionate signal in that, that that wasn't captured, does that affect things or is it really just the timing that's important and not the relative magnitude? I mean, ideally, it should really just be the timing and the shape of the time series that would be important. Um, of course, in practice, Sierra Negra dominates everything else happening because the magnitude is so much larger. So in, in the first step doing the ICA is a, a principal component analysis. And, and you have a choice to make as to how many components that you then go on to retrieve. Um, so if you're, if you think that one of the components might be relatively low variance compared to the rest of the system, it's going to be easy to lose that if you get that number wrong. Um, but the answer is, I mean, I think the correlations are robust in spite of Sierra Negra being the biggest. Um, it's all normalized before you do the analysis. Oh, sorry, Patty. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, I think there are some examples of this also in Iceland over very long distances. You may have heard of them between like a the onset of the Krabla fires and then subsidence onset in Askia, 80 mm -hmm. kilometers away. But the question was more about the exact timing of when you start to see these changes. Can you really see like a wave uh, from north to south, for example, after the Sarah? Something that like that the ones that are closer see the change earlier than those that are further away? No, it's a good question. And we looked for that. Uh, but the answer is no, we don't really see that. And I, I'm, to be honest, I'm not completely sure whether that's to do with the resolution of our time series. Um, or perhaps it's also affected by other modifying processes that affect the timing of the change in pressure at the shallow systems. And I think this is one of the more puzzling things about the answer that we've come up with is that um, to, from the point of view of our, of our data set, these things kind of look like the correlations are simultaneous. Um, so we tried to you know, fit, solve for a lag time as well. And we find the lag time to, you know, to our best guess is zero, which seems kind of improbable. <laughs> um, but I wonder if that might just be uh, the result of the kind of data uncertainty rather than something we can completely trust. I mean, it'd be really nice to be able to do this on a GPS time series and see see if you got a similar result. Okay, thank you. Maybe you have one last question. Quick one. Uh, please use the microphone. I think otherwise it's not. Quick one. Quick one. Okay. Well. Very interesting. Um, you said something that the random probability for Sierra Negra to erupt after um, Fernandina eruption is 6%. It, uh, less than a percent, I think it was. But so Fernandina, the number doesn't look right to me. Fernandina is erupting every two, three years or four years or something like that. Then mm -hmm. The pr probability should be much higher, isn't it? The random probability. Yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a slightly rough back of the envelope calculation. And obviously, it depends on the window over which you take the number of uh, eruptions. You know, it depends on the time interval that you look and take that number from. Um, I think that that calculation came from the window, uh, the 20th century eruption rate. Um, and you, it will vary whether, if you pick a shorter time window or a longer one. Um, I, the problem with the other problem, I think there's a problem with that approach anyway, <laughs> in that. Um, we don't really expect the eruptions to be randomly distributed through time. So it's essentially just to give a kind of a, you know, a, a, a um, to test the confidence uh, that we have in the time series correlating at random. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we move on to the next presenter, who is um, Adriano Nugele from Faust, and he will talk about ASCIA volcano. I need to talk. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Adriano, and uh, today I will talk to you about, I will show you some uh, nice interferogram uh, that show the interaction between uh, the magma chamber and the uh, caldera ring fault at the Askia caldera, at Askia volcano in Iceland. So, uh, caldera forms after a big eruption or a big magmatic intrusion that empty the magma chamber. Uh, and uh, um, the roof block collapse uh, along the ring faults, uh, generating the um, uh, characteristic caldera depression. 
uh, further um, pressure change inside the magma chamber can uh, trigger some slip along the ring faults, uh, generating some peculiar deformation pattern. In particular, you can see again. Sorry. Uh, you can see that uh, the um, deformation is constrained inside the caldera, and uh, in general, there are uh, larger deformation nearby the rim. Uh, furthermore, when the um, magma chamber is interacting with differently with different parts of the ring fault, can generate uh, asymmetrical displacement as we are during the 2014 collapse at Badlamboum. So Askia is located in the North Volcanic Zone in, uh, in the Icelandic Rift. Uh, it consists of a central volcano with three um, caldera uh, and uh, erupted fissure swarm in the north and the southwest. Last eruption occurred in 1961 in this area uh, with the lava flowing uh, toward the west. Um, after this uh, episode, the uh, volcanic system has been uh, really well monitored, and uh, in particular, uh, we have uh, uh, geodetic data since 1966. Uh, this data shows that uh, in uh, 90, between 1970 and 1973, uh, the caldera was uplifting, and then it started to subside uh, with a uh, decreasing rate. In our data uh, shows that uh, the deformation was mainly constrained inside the caldera, but there was also some uh, deformation in the um, uh, uh, erupted swarm uh, area in the north. Uh, uh, the inversion of these data suggests the presence of a shallow magma chamber uh, at three kilometer depth. Uh, and, uh, however, part of the deformation uh, was not, uh, they were not able to model it, so it's explained with the opening of the uh, The deformation, the subsidence continued until uh, 2021, as highlighted by GPS data, but uh, in uh, August uh, uh, 2021, uh, the situation completely changed, so it started to uplift with a really fast fast rate, about 60 centimeters uh, per uh, year in, uh, during, four, during three months, more or less. And then uh, the, the uplift was uh, still ongoing and uh, is uh, more or less constant with 30 centimeters per year. At the same, in the same period, uh, the seismicity started to increase again for uh, three months until November. The seismicity was quite high below the sea rate. Uh, and then it went back to the background, uh, uh, background level. Uh, for this study, we used, we used the Sentinel-1 data. The area is covered by four uh, tracks, two in ascending and two in descending. Unfortunately, most of the year, Askia is covered by ice or uh, snow, so we could use only images acquired um, between uh, July, August, and the beginning of September. Uh, finally, some things. Uh, so uh, I will show you uh, the, the arrow here for the temporal evolution. Uh, on the first line, we have the filter and interferogram and the corresponding deformation uh, map on the second line. Uh, the first interferogram spanned five years between uh, July 2016 and July 2021. It shows movement away from the satellite, so consistent with accidents. The second one is a really short uh, interferogram, so 42 days, and um, it shows the change on the deformation pattern. So now it's uh, in uplift, and uh, in uh, less than two months, it recovered completely the deformation uh, uh, produced during the previous five years. Uh, the third interferogram is a uh, one year uh, time span and it covered the period between September 2021 and September 2022. Uh, 29 centimeters of uh, movement uh, toward the satellite, so again, nothing. And uh, the last interferogram, again, uh, September 2022 uh, and uh, end of August 2023, 
Uh, and again, 29 centimeter of uplift. These uh, two last interferogram are really consistent with the um, uh, linear deformation pattern uh, observed with the GPFT. Uh, so, two things to notice. So, the deformation is mainly constrained inside the caldera and it's hollow, the structure observed at the surface. Um, another thing to notice is that the deformation pattern between the subsidence and uh, the uplift is almost the same, and uh, the maximum uplift uh, is uh, shifted north for the subsidence of uh, 100 meters. So, for us, uh, our interpretation is that the source of the two deformation uh, is uh, the same. Uh, as I was saying, uh, there are four orbits, so we process the deformation time series, and uh, here I'm showing the deformation map uh, for the um, period between 2017 and 2021. All the four orbits show movement uh, away, uh, away from the satellite, so that's, that is consistent with subsidence. Instead, for the deformation map between 2021 and 2022, uh, we have movement toward the satellite consistent with that. If we compare the two uh, ascending uh, orbit and the two descending orbit, we can see that the deformation is exactly the same. Uh, and uh, if we don't compare instead the deformation between one ascending and one descending, we can see that in general the ascending, uh, the amplitude of the ascending is larger than the descending, and the deformation is slightly different. This is due to the different looking geometry, uh, but it means also that there is a, uh, an horizontal component in the distortion. So we combine the two, one ascending and one descending orbit to get the vertical and the nearly east west component uh, for the subsequent period and the uplift period, uh, more or less uh, uh, 14, 14 centimeters of subsidence uh, um, during four years and uh, 40, 45 centimeter of uplift uh, in uh, one year. Uh, for the horizontal component here, uh, you can see the, probably, the two lobes moving toward the center of the caldera. Uh, this part, uh, so our reference point is on North American plate uh, fixed. So this part is a Eurasian plate moving uh, toward the east. Um, and probably you can see here some uh, deformation that uh, Sigurion Johnson will show better uh, this afternoon. Um, this is instead the deformation during the uplift period, and you have the two lobes moving apart. Uh, we are talking about 20 centimeter uh, per each lobe. We extracted uh, uh, two. The, um, uh, uh, horizontal, uh, okay, we, we extracted the, this profile for the vertical component. I will talk about, only about the first one, that is the one in the north. Uh, so, four centimeter of subsidence uh, in the eruptive tissue area uh, during the period 2017 2021, and three centimeter during the period. Uh, 2021, 2022, meaning that uh, there is an acceleration in the um, deformation inside the rift during the undress orbit. So there is possibly an interaction between the uh, magmatic surface of Asia and the uh, rift extension. Uh, we move now to the deformation third. Uh, I tried to model the deformation with uh, one third. In this case, is uh, one seal. Uh, we use analytical model and we inverted the, the four uh, orbits. I'm showing only two. Um, so the seal is located. Uh, the center of the seal is located uh, below the um, uh, ring. Let's say the center of Asia Caldera, and it is on the shore of the lake. Um, it's located at 2.6 kilometer, that is uh, close by the three kilometer observed for the subsidence. Uh, we could explain uh, only between the 55 and the 71% of the total displacement observed, so not so much. 
Uh, and if we look at the residual, uh, in general, we have uh, an uh, overestimation uh, of the maximum displacement and uh, an overestimation uh, uh, of the um, signal nearby the rainfall. Yeah, and uh, instead, uh, is the opposite in the middle of the caldera. I will talk about this part uh, later. So. Since the deformation obtained with the only the seal was uh, not enough, we tried to model the interaction between the seal and the caldera rainfall. For this, we used the uh, boundary element models, and uh, we implemented uh, this uh, on uh, the BIT software, Bayesian Earthquake Analysis Tool. Uh, so in this case, the seal is inflating and is pushing up the, the rainfalls. Uh, Depending on the position of the of the seal with respect to the ring fault, the nodes of the ring faults move uh, differently. Uh, what we obtained uh, is a deformation curve that uh, deformation pattern that is uh, asymmetric and uh, is quite similar to the uh, to the one observed with infrared for both ascending and descending orbit. We improved the uh, variance reduction. Uh, now we are between 74 and 80, 90%. If we look at the residual uh, for the descending, they are really well distributed and uh, quite small. In fact, for the ascending, we still have uh, some problems. Okay, this part uh, is um, uh, located above um, uh, low velocity seismic zone uh, and uh, this area is interpreted with the uh, presence of um, fluids so probably the heterogeneities that uh, in our uh, model is uh, cannot be in introduced uh, here only a quick comparison between the vertical uh, displacement observed uh, observed modeled with the seal and modeled with the seal and rainfall you can see that the seal uh, overestimates um, the displacement. Instead, the ring fault uh, and the seal uh, fit better with the data. Uh, another thing to notice is that here, uh, that corresponds to this zone, uh, there is an anomaly in the deformation trend. Uh, this area is uh, close by the the ring fault of Ostiwatsun caldera, and uh, there are also eruptive fissures. So our interpretation is that this um, uh, these features uh, can interact with uh, can produce part of the deformation. So just to conclude. Okay, we did start, we could uh, observe the 2016-2021 um, subsidence and the rate was still decreasing comparing uh, with the previous uh, geodetic results. Um, um, we could observe the 2021-2022 uplift and we, can, we could see that uh, the uplift is still ongoing with the uh, um, uh, linear trend. Uh, possibly the deformation uh, source of the subsidence and the uplift uh, is the same. And uh, then uh, there is an in interaction between the magmatic system of Askia and the uh, rift. Uh, if we look at the modeling, uh, one source is not enough to explain the, uh, the observed deformation. Uh, instead, with the interaction between the two, the seal and the um, ring fault, we could improve the, the fit with the data. But however, there are further complexities like the presence of fluids or uh, even the subsidence uh, due to the, um, uh, to the rift opening that we could not model. Uh, as far as I know, there is a new project uh, with a lot of uh, seismic stations installed uh, in uh, Askia to study the micro seismicity and uh, check uh, if the uh, ring fault are uh, active or not. And then, uh, last thing, uh, during this uh, uh, winter, at some point, the lake that in general is completely covered by ice, uh, the ice from the lake completely melted. 
between February and March. Uh, so it would be nice to have uh, information about the late uh, project. With this, I can conclude. I don't know. Since I have time, I will show you another slide. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we cannot really add the, the um, second ring fault inside the, for the lake uh, because uh, it's quite complex uh, making an inversion with the Bayesian inference. There are too much parameters, but uh, we did some tests uh, uh, with uh, forward modeling, and uh, as you can see here, this, the black line is the total displacement, and uh, in this case, we could model the anomaly that we can we saw before uh, nearby the uh, the lake. So uh, I mean, uh, it was just uh, an extra slide to try to convince you that the ring fault can produce part of the lake image. Thank you again. Thank you, Adriano, for this interesting insight into ASPIA. I'm sure there are questions. All the experiments that we did, uh, the test, uh, I would say that uh, for the 30 centi 40 centimeters that we observed of uplift, only less than 10 percent uh, is uh, due to the ring fault. Oh. Less than. We have another question up there. Yeah. I can do this. Okay. Um, really neat results. Uh, just one question. So, when you're modeling, uh, how would you scale the user ID for the whole range of Uh, no, I didn't try the distributed uh, opening. Uh, it was something uh, planned, but in the end, uh, we said, okay, actually, the thing is that we don't have any constraint for the ring faults and the uh, depth of the seal, so it was only a test to understand which was the best parameter uh, to choose for the seal and then make the um, uh, forward modeling in the beginning. Then now we are implementing it uh, in, on the other Bayesian software that, that is looking for the best model. So uh, we are changing a bit the uh, research line. Thank you for here for Uh, I didn't get for uh, I mean for us the um, ring faults are buried so are located the, the top is uh, 800 meters below the surface uh, if we tried with boundary element model to go too close to the surface we got uh, some, some strange anomalies uh, however, uh, again, looking at the ground deformation uh, obtained by the ring fault, if you move the ring fault too close, you have really steep uh, deformation and uh, it's not what we are seeing. So we try to keep them, uh, let's say, at uh, a certain uh, depth below 500 meters. Um, sorry, but there was like another question up there, and if we accept this one, I think we have another. Sorry, <laughs> just to be fair. Uh, 
uh, so uh, this is again another uh, things uh, on uh, ongoing uh, and uh, we are trying to understand which is the best way to compare let's say the different models but uh, yeah we are for the moment we have the variance reduction uh, for uh, uh for this and okay is a good improvement because this 10 percent so is a huge difference uh but yeah uh, i mean uh, the unless uh, is working on uh, on this part and the statistical part to make uh, some tests uh, we have a lot of parameters so uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, we need to justify all these parameters, and it's quite uh, quite tricky. The user plan. Okay, and then one very last question in the front. No, please go ahead. Yeah, can you please? Uh, so for uh, we define the first layer and the second layer of the the first uh, the top of the ring fault and the bottom of the ring fault so the position and uh, sides to the uh, a and b the uh, is an ellipse so the two coordinates and then uh, we can define the depth uh, of the two layers uh, and uh, we create the mesh in between so i don't know Okay. okay, I reply to your question. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for all um, the, the questions and this very nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. So you, we move on to the next speaker, Mich Michel. Uh, that's going to tell us about a uh, new project, Peace Volk. Okay, hello everyone. So um, this presentation is essentially just going to give a quick overview of this new project um, called ISVOLC. And essentially the project is addressing the effects of deglaciation on variations in both seismic and volcanic activity in Iceland. Okay, so the project is, is funded by RANIS, the Icelandic Research Fund. Um, essentially, it was awarded as a grant of excellence project um, in January this year. And it actually comprises um, essentially a collaboration of about 20 researchers, international researchers, so both from Iceland and abroad. Um, the institutes are shown on this slide. And these researchers are from 11 partner institutes. Okay, so the, the project officially started on the 1st of April this year. It has a duration of three years and a budget of about 153 million Icelandic krona. So that's equivalent now to about 1 million euros. Um, the project itself will fund two PhD students working in Iceland based at University of Iceland plus a postdoc for two years who will be based at the Icelandic Met Office, some contracting work and also field work in years one and two of the project, um, plus some software as well. So why are we doing this? Because glaciers cover approximately 10% of Iceland, and they have been retreating since 1890. And I mean, this is extremely evident when you look at these outlet glaciers in particular in Iceland. So here we have an example of Solheim Jökull. This is an outlet glacier essentially on the southwestern side of that Jökull glacier, which hosts Katla volcano. So here, this picture you're looking at is from 1997. Here we have 2000, 2003, 2005, 6, and 10. 
So it is very clear that the glaciers are retreating. The climate change predictions essentially in the future indicate that this is going to continue and at quite an alarming rate. So at the end of the last major deglaciation some 12,000 years ago, there was actually a 30 to 50 fold increase in eruptive activity in Iceland. This will happen again. It's no longer a question of if this will happen, it's a question essentially of when and by how much. Okay, so what is the hypothesis of the project? The main hypotheses are these, essentially that this melt loss is already affecting um, the volcanoes in Iceland. Essentially, it's generating more, mantin, more melt in the mantle due to decompression melting. It's also resulting in stress changes in both the mantle and the crust. And so these stress changes are affecting magma migration, and they're also affecting the stability of existing magma bodies. So in this case, um, they could actually either bring a magma body closer or further from failure. So if it's actually the former, this could mean more frequent eruptions in Iceland, and if it's the latter, it could mean much larger eruptions, both in terms of explosive and effusive activity. So it's also affecting um, earthquake potentially as well, or earthquake activity, so essentially by, by stressing major earthquake zones. So in the project, we're going to focus on, on both of these things, and by doing so, we're looking at four target volcanoes, and they're shown on the map here. Sorry, I don't think the pointer works. But essentially, so in the south, um, we have Katla volcano under Murtis Jokul Glacier. Under Vatna Jokul, which is the largest glacier you can see there, we've got Grimsvert Bada Bunga, and to the north of that, Askia, which was, was just the topic of Adriano's presentation, a volcano that's currently in unrest. Um, in addition to this, we're also focusing on two main seismic zones. So in the south, we've got the South Iceland seismic zone, and in the north, the Chornos fracture zone. Okay, so what do we actually plan to do in the project? Well, firstly, we plan to generate a new database of these ice changes, essentially, since the end of the, the Little Ice Age, so for the last 130 years. On top of that, we're then going to create new 3D, or I should say 4D, um, GIA models. So these are glacial isostatic adjustment models um, for all of Iceland. Um, so, so essentially, due to the deglaciation, the crust is rebounding, and, and this term is referred to as glacial isostatic adjustment. Of course, this rebound effect is what's producing more melt, melt in the mantle um, and also affecting stress changes in the crust. Um, so another work package, we're going to develop advanced 3D magma um, plumbing models, essentially of the target volcano. So of the, the volcano plumbing systems beneath these volcanoes, these will initially be based on, on the simple analytical models, but then of course we'll be building advanced finite element models after this with different degrees of complexity. So after this we plan to generate future scenarios for the, for the melt loss on, on Vatna Jokul, so projections for the future. So this may be looking at 50, 100, 200, and 300 years from now, and then computing the GIA models based on this as well. Um, okay, so if we take a look at the actual work packages, there's five work packages in total involved in this project. So the first one, geodetic and glacier mass balance observations. So the first part of this is generating the extended time series of our GPS or GNSS observations across all of Iceland. So this involves essentially creating the, or updating the time series, I should say, for around 100 continuous stations, plus also our campaign observations as well. On top of that, we'll be re-estimating the countrywide, essentially, INSAR maps or velocities. So here we have an example um, from, from Druin and Sigmundsen on the right-hand side. Now, this is essentially the, the vertical measurements we're looking at here, or the near vertical measurements for all of Iceland, and this was estimated from Sentinel-1 data. So we'll be updating these maps, and again, this will primarily be using Sentinel for the INSAR analysis and decomposition, but on top of that, we'll be using other supersite data, such as Cosmos SkyMed and TerraSAR-X data, specifically in the regions of our target volcanoes. Um... Okay, so, and of course, the other main part of this work package is, is generating these new time variant ice history models for the last 130 years. So the next work package is primarily associated with the GIA model, the, the glacial isostatic adjustment modeling. 
Um, but this, as I say, will create a new generation of 4D models. Um, so the input of this, of course, will be the mass balance observations from work package one, um, and also the, the geodetic observations. So essentially, um, the Earth models will be constrained using the, the geodetic data. Um, and um, yes, and essentially combining the Earth models and, and the ice history models produces our GIA model. Um, the next main part of this work package, of course, is then re-estimating the changes in the melt production rate in the mantle. And this can be done by computing the pressure changes, um, essentially, from, from the GIA. So work package three is the advanced models of target volcanoes. Um, and as I say, initially we will, we will base the work on, on known models from analytical models at these target volcanoes. Um, essentially after that, we'll be producing new finite element models for, for each of these volcanic systems. And we plan to undertake this work in, in COMSOL. Um, we'll also compute the, the Coulomb failure stress um, and see how this actually affects seismicity in, in you know, on main fault orientations in our, in our seismic zones, as well as, as investigating how it's modifying local seismicity at our target volcanoes. So work package four is coupling of the GIA and the volcano deformation models. And what we plan to do in this work package is, is essentially project the stress field induced um, by the by the ice ice loss by the by the GIA onto our target volcano systems um, to see how this is perturbing um, essentially changes in in the stress field around existing magma bodies. Is it bringing them closer or further further from failure? How is it affecting magma migration pathways in the area, um, et cetera? We were actually initially um, looking at trying to physically combine or thinking about combining the two models. But of course, there's a lot more added complexity there because of the significantly different both temporal and spatial scales of these two models, the GIA versus the volcano models. OK, and work package five. So this is hazard assessment and forecasting. Um, so as I said earlier, what we really plan to do here is um, generate future projections of the melt loss for Vatna Yokel Great Glacier. So at 50, 100, 200, 300 years into the future. And from this, essentially generate new 4D GIA models. So once we've generated those models, again, we can, we can estimate the new um, melt production rates for these different time periods. Okay, so just quickly now, the dissemination plan for the project. I mean, we really want to make as much as possible publicly available and, and really as soon as this can be done. Um, so one of the, I think, the main advances here will be this database. We plan to create a publicly available database with all the GIA models um, and also the ice history models that we're using within the project. So this database um, will contain, obviously, all the, the GIA surface displacements and velocities. Um, on top of that, any code that's generated within the project, um, so by the researchers um, or the students, will also be made available in some open source repository, such as OSF Home. OK, so field work. So this year, we've actually already undertaken two field campaigns. So one at Grimsvert, which was undertaken in the spring, um, and one at Askia as well, which was just done last month. So at Grimsvert, we, we visited, or actually this was led by Heldor Gearson at the University of Iceland. Um, and Heldor visited essentially six of our existing stations, GNSS stations there, and, and uh, made measurements at five of these. So this comprised of essentially, in some cases, installing new, com new equipment, so new antennas, solar panels, et cetera. Um, and in other cases, just reoccupying stations that hadn't been visited for many years. On the lower left-hand side, here's an example of a campaign installation um, at HUSB. And this is situated to the southwest of the caldera. In the middle, um, again, an installation at SVV2. And this is right on the southern rim of the Grimsberg caldera. Um, and then uh, on the right-hand side, campaign um, GNSS measurements at ASCIA. And this is on the... This is essentially at the station A404, which is on the 1961 lava field. 
So at ASCIA, on top of the campaign GNSS work, we also undertook leveling. This was led by Eric Sturkel. Um, gravity and also gas measurements um, undertaken by myself and Melissa Pfeffer at IMO. So future ISVOLT meetings um, and presentations. So we're planning actually to hold uh, a workshop just later this year at the end of October in Iceland. And um, this will mainly be to start training the, the PhD students um, and get everyone together working on the project. And um, Fabian Albino will be joining us. And Elisa Trasalti from INGV and also Peter Schmidt from Uppsala. Uh, Freston Sigmundson will be giving a presentation with some new results at, at AGU um, in December this year. And then we'll have another project meeting at EGU in April uh, the following year. So we've already hired two new PhD students to work on the project. One is going to start straight away, essentially. Well, she started yesterday, in fact, um, working on the volcano deformation models and, in fact, ASCIA, finite element modeling. Um, we have a second student coming in October who will primarily be working on the ice history and the GIA modeling. Um, and then we've got funding also for a third student through the University of Iceland Research Fund. Um, so this student will be working on a combination of, of GIA and, and volcano models. We're also collaborating with James Hickey at Exeter, and um, he's just recently had um, a PhD um, project funded as well by the EPSRC. So this student will collaborate with us on the project and work on is vol volcanoes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have funding for a postdoc position for two years. And, um, I foresee that this postdoc would work primarily on work packages four and five, so combining the, the GIA and the volcano deformation models, and then also working on the forecasting um, work package. So this postdoc would be based on with myself at, at IMO at the Icelandic Met Office. If you know of anyone who could be interested, please drop me an email. Um, and Peter Schmidt is currently working on updating the previous GIA model, and this hadn't been updated since 2013. So we hope to see some, some new results from Peter quite soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michel. Uh, any question or comments about the Isabel project? Thank you. A great presentation. I was wondering how, how far back do you want to make it work? Hmm. We're aiming, um, apparently, for the last 130 years, though the glaciologists claim that, um, of course, it's, you know, the, the temporal um, resolution of these models is, is going to be, you know, greatly varied, right, depending on, on how far we go back in history and what kind of measurements that we have available. But, but yes, I mean, this is the plan, to go back at least 100 years. Mm. Yeah. How, much, how much bigger are the rock going to be? Do you think that? <laughs> the, the, oh, project. the project has started, <laughs> but no, okay, I can, I'm just joking, I can, um, well, for example, so from Peter's um, last work on this, um, which was in 2013, at that time he estimated that there was 150% more melt being generated in the mantle, so and obviously the deglaciation de is continuing, um, models will be updated, but uh, I'm expecting it to be more, obviously, than that from the last estimate for the melt generation. Of course, then it depends on, you know, the timing it takes for, for this new melt that's generated to come from very deep levels, let's say greater than 100 kilometers to the upper crust. Okay, so there's a model that you can There's the timing, yeah. And how much of that actually reaches Hmm. Can you say this rough number? How much, how much bigger would it be if we were to 
If you've removed all the ice, no, I can't give you an estimate, sorry, offhand. But, uh, but of course, this is what we're going to be working on, right? And this will be in the, in the final work package, work package five, which is the forecasting and future scenarios. Okay. Anyone? Question? Comment? No? OK, thank you, Michel. We're going to move on. Thank you. Okay, we move on with the last speaker of this first uh, volcano session. Um, the next speaker is Birhan Abera Kobede from University of Pisa. And uh, the presentation will be about the Tulumoji Volcanic Compact and the main Ethiopian Rift. So, hello everyone. As you can see, I'm not Birhan. <laughs> I'm Alessandro Arosa from the Earth Science Department of Pisa. And today I uh, will present on, be on behalf of uh, Birana Berakebede, which is a PhD student working with us at the, in our department. And this study that I will present will be an, an analysis of ground deformation processes uh, on the Tulum Oya volcanic complex uh, in, uh, in the Mini Ethiopian uh, rift. So, why this volcano? Uh, Tulum Oya uh, is located within uh, the Mini Ethiopian rift, which is an active rift located in the Northernmost part of the East African Rift system uh, along the axis, uh, the axis, and together with um, uh, as other um, volcanic system, for example, uh, for example, Corbetti or Aluto, uh, this volcano is interested by intense it flows and thermal activity. Uh, so we, that makes this area a perfect site for uh, geothermal energy uh, exploitation and exploration. In fact, as you can um, see from, in, from this yellow start, there are already some uh, power plants uh, active in this area and other uh, active drilling uh, from, are ongoing in the area for, uh, for further exploration. Um, a bit more in detail about the tecton volcano tectonic setting of this volcanic complex. So uh, the volcano is characterized by um, a large caldera system uh, with several uh, concentric green faults hosting various volcanoes, for example, uh, Bora, Berecha, and Tulumoya volcano. And uh, this area is also uh, dissected by cross-cutting system of faults. So we have the uh, north, northeast striking faults pertaining to, um, uh, related to the um, active rifting in the area, the so-called Wongi fault belt, here light in, in pink, and then we have, we have other north, um, northwest and north northwest striking faults, uh, probably related to a previous phase of the rifting or to some inherited um, structures highlighted in, uh, in blue. So this volcano is, uh, is actively deforming, uh, but the nature of the, the deforming source is a bit debated. So we have two. Uh, hypothesis about the deformation in the area. So um, it could be either magmatic or geothermal. So there are previous studies uh, using INSAR on, the, on this area uh, by Big Zeral uh, 2011 that used MVSAT uh, time series from 2004 to 2010. And they observe a series of alternating uplift and, um, and subsidence phases uh, in Turumoye. They also um, modeled this deformation and infer a magma body at a 2.5 kilometer depth. And more recently, uh, Albinum Biggs 2021 um, also analyzed Sentinel-1 uh, data for this area along with other volcanoes on, on the East African Rift system. And they observed uh, continuous uplift starting from 2015 to 2020. So in this case, the, uh, the deformation has not been uh, modeled because it was a more an overview, a large scale overview of the old volcanoes, but they, this uh, pattern has been interpreted with a magmatic, uh, as caused by a magmatic source. So on the other side, for the geothermal team, we have uh, uh, some rock uh, that use magnetotelluric uh, data to observe a big high conductivity body beneath uh, Benito Lumoya, which has been interpreted as the plumbing system of the volcano, and another shallower, another shallower uh, high conductivity body uh, here, like the uh, main C4, 
which has been interpreted as the shallow hydrothermal system. And uh, some rock used this observation to interpret the data from Biggs um, and suggest that this alternating uplift uh, and subsidence has been instead caused by this shallow uh, degassing, the de degassing in this shallow uh, hydrothermal system. So we try to uh, take part to this debate and we um, analyze Sentinel time series from Sentinel 1, uh, sorry, um, Sentinel 1 time series. We produce average velocity maps and we um, carry out the modeling and combine all this data, uh, satellite data with the, the independent magneto telluric data and seismic data for this area. So the main aim was to investigate the locus magnitude and cell of the deformation, try to constrain the causes of this deformation and try to build up an integrated model of both the magmatic and the endothermal system based on, on this independent data. So uh, for our 10 series analysis and ever velocity maps, we used the, the uh, sub, um, small baseline subset approach implemented in the ESA geothermal exploitation platform. And we produced average velocity maps for uh, from both ascending and descending tracks for the time period between 2014 and 2017 which is the longest time period allowed from uh, for the by, by the ascending track there are no more acquisition after 2017 for this track uh, but then we also process time series uh, for uh, 2004 between 2014 2022 from the descending and again as i said uh, for uh, uh, we are uh, we have just the shortest time period for for the ascending. So here, here you see the two networks for the descending on the top and ascending interferon and ascending trucks. So here you see the uh, result, the average velocity maps for the short time period that we obtained uh, for Tulumoye and here for uh, negative values indicate range, range decrease. So both maps are uh, show this pattern of range, range decrease with values of uh, no, no, I don't know if it's clear, but um, values of more or less 40, kilo, uh, 40 millimeters per year in both tracks. And so this is consistent, consistent with our vertical uplift pattern. Uh, the, part, the pattern is also uh, located within the, the caldera between Bora Beric and Tulumoye. And it is uh, more or less 10 by 10 kilometers wide. Uh, and it's elongated more or less in the northwest of this direction. Um, so uh, we also uh, take a look to the took a look to the time series, and the descending track, which is the long one, show um, a rapid uplift phase starting from 2015 until 2017 with 40, 40 millimeters per year, more or less uh, consistent with what, what has been observed by Albino and Bix and uh, followed by a, a period where uplift continued but uh, slowed down uh, to more or less 12 millimeters per year until 2022. Uh, the ascending track was very noisy, uh, but here we put it for uh, as a comparison, but more or less it's like showing a similar trend at least for the short time period. Uh, we also com um, compared this time series for, with uh, uh, micro seismicity recorded by Greenfield et al. 2016, and you can see that the year is like the seismicity is represented by this uh, purple purple curve, and at least for the time period for the time period 2016 2017, this rapid uplift phase is also accompanied by um, increase in the micro seismicity. <laughs> so we try to we, we model the deformation associated with the uh, uh, observed by the average velocity maps for the shortest time period and we use a pretty standard approach we first subsample the the two average velocity maps using a quarter partitioning partitioning algorithm and then we create a variance covariance metric of a spatially correlated random noise uh, and we use uh, by, by sampling an area in the top right corner of the map. And we uh, combine, use this, uh, this information to carry out a weighted uh, uh, joint inversion of the two maps, uh, assuming an OCADA tensor dislocation uh, source. So, model in trying to model it as a seal. Uh, for the inversion, we use a Monte Carlo simulated annealing uh, algorithm followed by, followed by a derivative approach. Uh, following the approach of Cervelleral uh, 2001. 
So here you can see the result uh, of our modeling. Uh, so in the two left panel, there is still the observation, the model is in the middle, and the residual on the right two panels for ascending and descending. So our best fit model is uh, represented by a northwest uh, southeast striking seal, which is located at a depth of 7.7 .7 kilometers and uh, opening at a rate of 0 0.85 meters per year. I, um, I forgot to say that we use an elastical space. So assuming an elastical space, this could, would correspond to a volume rate change of 8.9 times 10 to the power of 6 meters cubic, uh, cubic meter per year. Um, so uh, yes, the model explained quite well the, the residual. And here on, the, on this table, you can see further parameters for, the, uh, for our seal. So the, the seal is quite uh, elongated in the northwest north direction with a length of uh, 8.7 kilometers and, uh, and the width of 1.2. And it's gently dipping to the southwest or with uh, 11 degrees. So we use the VCM of the spatially correlated noise to create 100 simulations uh, of the noise that we had to, to, our, to our observation to calculate the uncertainties. So here you see the result of the calculation and you see that the parameters show a uh, very narrow variability. And our best fit model falls quite well within the uh, maximum of, our, of the frequency distribution for this parameter, which is suggests that our, our parameters are quite constrained. So, uh, yes. Uh, we combine our model with this other independent geophysical observation with magnetotelluric and seismic data. And as you can see, uh, the, the comparison with the magnetotelluric suggests that the, uh, that the dike, the, the seal, sorry, uh, it's located on the, uh, the upper edge of this high conductivity magma body. And also, as this southwest dipping, uh, which is similar, if not very clear from this from this view, but it's similar to the southwest dip that has this big plumbing system. So also, uh, this uh, this seal is located one or two kilometers below the cluster of micro seismicity observed during 2016 2017, and it's sub parallel to the northwest striking fault system uh, of the caldera, which could suggest there is a structural control. Uh, for the emplacement of, uh, of this seal. So try to collect all this, uh, all this information in one conclusion. So it could be that this northwest oriented fault could, be, could act a, as a channel, uh, could help in channel, uh, channelizing the magma into this elongated seal and also favor the fluid migration toward the surface. And uh, this is also suggested by the micro seismicity and the surface manifestation in correspondence uh, on surface above, above this implicit seal. So this could suggest that this seal could represent uh, an important heat source in the western part of the geothermal system. So and try to combine our observation with the previous inter-observations. This alternating uplift and sub uh, subsidence could be explained with the inflation of the magmatic uh, system that generate uplift, and at the same time with the gassing of the hydrothermal system that can generate the substance. And this has been something already observed for other volcanoes in the Manitopia Rift, for example, uh, for, for example, Alutu. So this I conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Yeah, do we have this one up there? Do we have the microphone, please? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the question is if uh, the different uh, source that we model here with this data is different from MVSAT because of the source or because of the temporal, uh, the, the time that we, the different time period that we investigated, right?
so uh, you use a penny shaped crack for your model, right? So basically assuming uh, modeling it as a seal. So I don't think that could be uh, too much difference uh, in terms of uh, the surface response of the seal. Uh, I would probably more, um, I would probably be for the other option. I mean, it's because of the time period investigated. Uh, looking at the looking at the magnetotelluric uh, surveys, we can see that there are also more shallower sources between zero and five kilometers. So it could be that what you observed in uh, in the previous space could be something related to more shallower sources. So I will not be surprised. So. Uh, not actually, not actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yes, of course, please. Yeah, sorry. I didn't understand fully this uh, differentiation between the hydrocarbon or going to use of source and you mean probably hydrocarbon source from um, just pressure, right? Uh, yeah. Can you uh, repeat the question? Oh, yes. Uh, he is asking for uh, clarifying better the surface deformation and what's caused the surface deformation, what caused the deeper deformation, right? Yes. Uh, well, for the you can you can you could be you could could be could be able to model a surface deformation related to geothermal activity. In this case, uh, there there are no evidences of a of a shallow source. But if the shallow source will be the cause of deformation, uh, it could be able to uh, be alighted by the modeling. I mean, the model it could solve this. Uh, regarding the uh, relationship between the sur this surface deformation and deeper one, uh, well, it could be that um, the two the the two sources have a temporal different temporal evolution. So maybe at surface you can see alternating uplift and subsidence related to the gassing and recharge of this shallow system, while uh, deeper sources can be related to other deformations, so behave in a different manner. In our case, we just observed this uh, this continuous uplift that progressively decay, and there were no evidences of other uh, clear evidences, at least of shallower activity that could sum to this deeper source. I don't know if I really responded. Thanks. Are there any other questions? I have one. Okay, please. <laughs> um, so basically, because the context is we have high flow of the high flow of temperature and and you know thermal systems so or flux of, of fluids, and especially now that the the time series show really nicely this exponential decay yeah. on the deformation, I was wondering, what do you think about maybe some viscoelastic relaxation and and how it could uh, impact the model if you consider some viscoelasticity? Okay, uh, regarding the the, the viscoelastic uh, modeling, uh, well, um, it has been shown in recent recent studies that when you try to uh, well we 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 model the short term deformation so between 2014 and 2017 so according to recent models you can assume that in this very short time this sudden pulse let's call it pulse of magma can be assumed as elastic so we didn't explore a uh, viscoelastic uh, a viscoelastic solution because we are not analyzing a longer time period to uh, investigate to, to be able to distinguish the viscose response on the long term, so it could be something to to explore with the, with longer. With the longer one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks. And there was another question up here. Oh. Hi. Hi. I just want to ask, uh, what happens there? Uh, okay. Um, in uh, the the jet portal applied to main uh, uh, to main atmospheric correction, which is the IPS. On the or with a medium filter on the on the temporal space, and then 
a, a, a correction on the layered component of the atmosphere using the linear correlation with the topography so using the DM. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we didn't find any other way to to remove more the solution. Actually, uh, using the the jet portal, you don't have too much control of a lot of parameters. This is something that I would really like they 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 improve. Uh, but uh, yes, with uh, for what we could do, there was no way to remove that that noise. This is something else which is out of our control. You cannot look at the single interferogram. Or, I mean, you can look at the single interferogram, but then it's you don't you don't have any way to exclude them from the processing. I mean, they are excluded on the basis of uh, like variance of, of, of poor coverage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it could be, um, but we didn't look her for it yet. But thanks for the one. Thank, thank you. We can take one or one or two questions. Also, if you have questions to any of the other speakers, we can still ask them because we have some time left. So remember that the, yeah there will be a, a round table uh, after all the three sessions from the volcanoes uh, when we have to kind of have some seats question and report it to the to ESA. So if you have in mind and if you uh, really uh, you know consider to to come to this uh, to this round table. So here, if there is no question, I think we can uh, close this volcano one. So please come to the next one, the second and the third volcano session in the afternoon. And uh, I remind you that there is also a poster session. So there will be, uh, of course, tomorrow afternoon. And there is many volcano uh, poster regarding uh, INSA application. So thank you. Thank you again, the speakers. Yeah, you know what? 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 You know what